Welcome to the Sounds of Encouragement, the place for musicians and music teachers to find support and encouragement to help you stay motivated, creative, and moving forward in what you do best. I'm Melissa Slocum, your host and number one encourager. I currently live in the Atlanta, Georgia area and have my own thriving studio teaching piano to all ages in person and online. I also help other teachers use student goal-based learning and differentiated instruction to increase motivation in their students and increase retention rates in their studios. You can learn more at www.musiclessonpathways.com. Thank you for tuning in to Sounds of Encouragement. Don't forget to subscribe so you get notified of future episodes. Enjoy the following episode. Don't forget to keep listening at the end and be sure to check out all the links in the comments or show notes. As always, I'm here for you, so you can be there for those who need you the most. Reach out to me at soundofencouragement at gmail.com and let me know how I can better support and encourage you. Gerardo Ramos Gonzalez is from Guadalajara, Mexico. He is a professor in the music department at the University of Guadalajara. His class is called Inglés Aplicado a la Música, I-A-M, English Applied to Music, which, under the English as a Second Language category, is English for Specific Purpose. All of his students are music majors within specific divisions, for example, performance majors, orchestra instruments, voices, conducting majors, composition majors, and music education majors. Each student has three semesters of I-A-M. He studied flute at the same school where he now teaches, with Andrzej Bosik from Poland. He studied music at the University of Guadalajara and then joined a military band in Guadalajara for three years. After that, he went to the University of Texas at El Paso. He was a linguistics major and music minor. He had the opportunity to play in different ensembles and take music theory classes there. While he did not graduate from UTEP, he did return to school in 2002 at Metropolitan State University in St. Paul, Minnesota. He has been teaching at the University of Guadalajara for over 12 years, and during that time he also earned a master's degree in linguistics at the University of Guadalajara, with some additional classes at the University of Bielefeld in Germany. During COVID, he continued teaching online with his students in Guadalajara. He has returned to Metropolitan State University and enrolled in the Master's in Liberal Studies program while teaching long distance, still with the University of Guadalajara. Please welcome my guest, Gerardo Gonzalez. Welcome to Sounds of Encouragement. My name is Melissa Slocum. You just heard a little bit about my guest, Gerardo. Gerardo, thank you so much for joining me for this interview today. Thank you for the invitation. It's an honor for me. So you grew up in Guadalajara in Mexico. Can you describe uh, yes. that location and that where how you grew up a little bit for us? Sure. Um, maybe you, you or, or audience have heard about Puerto Vallarta, a famous mm-hmm. resort. Sure. Puerto Vallarta is the same state. Guadalajara is nearby Puerto Vallarta, but not so close. And going by uh, highway, you have to go through the mountains. So, and go like up and down. So I'll say like four hours, five hours, Guadalajara from Puerto Vallarta, but because of the mountains. So it's the same state. It's kind of like in central Mexico, the Pacific, where the ship of Mexico is like, Turns like, like Guadalajara, uh, Puerto Vallarta is right there. So I'm from there. Guadalajara is a big city. It's about 5 million people wow. in the um, uh, metro area. And uh, we have no freeways or highways. So you can imagine <laughs> the traffic. Yes. So but it's a beautiful city. It's old and it has also new infrastructure. So it's, it's, it's a very uh, progressive and uh, very dynamic city. I have not been yet, but that is definitely one of the cities on my list to to be uh, able to explore at some point. Uh, and so you are currently in- It's the in... land of the mariachi and tequila. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you are currently in the yeah. Minneapolis area, just north of Minneapolis, correct? Yes, correct. And Chisago is the city is called Chisago. Yes, yes. And- I this... moved here on- uh, Go ahead. See, I moved here October 19th. 
August 19th. I moved here on August 19th. Okay. Just last year. Okay. That's quite the move. To, Minia, quite... to Minnesota. So, so you have had your first winter. Yeah, from Guadalajara to... Yes. Yes. It's very cold. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I am from the Midwest. I, I was born in Minnesota and uh, grew up in Wisconsin, so I'm very familiar with Midwestern winters. <laughs> okay. And we know each other through our mutual friend, James Kessler, um, dear friend, James Kessler. And um, he was wonderful enough to introduce us. Uh, but this is really the first time that we've had a chance to share a little bit and talk a little bit. And you have shared so many wonderful uh, pictures and images and things with me ahead of time. Um, but before we get to some of the pictures that you sent about the school in Guadalajara where you teach, can you share a little bit about uh, looking back in your life about encouragement and maybe important moments where people have encouraged you in your life and what that has looked like? Sure. Um... It was very difficult growing up in, in Mexico. Um, I went to study music. There's still some, a little like stigma, I don't know if that's the correct word, like no, don't study music. Or, yeah. or a lot of people still think that music is kind of a career or that you go to school to study music. Yeah. You know, Mexico is a big and you know, a folk music, you know? Right. Every state has their own distinctive music. It's beautiful music. That's fine. And people have that idea that so, some people even nowadays believe that it's kind of strange to go to school to learn music. Right. So growing up in a family of uh, seven siblings and pa father, mother, and grandma in the same house in the two bedroom home. Wow. And so it was like studying music was like no, yeah, no, no way. No, we <laughs> I my parents had bakers. So oh. since I was a kid, I was working in the bakery, delivering sure. bread in, in a basket in my head. Wow. When I was a kid and selling bread in the street. And uh, so studying music, it was no, we had to work. Yeah. And, so, uh, but I wanted to to play flute. And uh, I, went, I was playing recorder. And I think it was my flute professor at the music school in Guadalajara. His name is Andres Ekbosek. He's from Poland. Mm -hmm. And I was about 15 or 16 when I met him. Mm. And I, for me, he was like my hero, father figure, mentor, wow. everything. I put all my faith in him. And I think that he and me too, because right. he was very supportive of uh, me learning. And I'm very grateful that I got the chance to meet him. Mm. And that was a long, long ago, but uh, uh, he was, uh, he played, it's because of him that I stuck with a uh, flute and keep playing mm. for the, because of this professor. And how long did you study with him? Um, I think three years, uh, three, three years. And then I went to live in Chiapas. It was just a border Guatemala and Mexico. And two years later, I returned to Guadalajara. So I would say total maybe five years with him. Five, wow. six years, the, the most. Then I moved to other places. And by then I was in my late teens, or early 20s. And, uh, but I was, I was in touch with him uh, through the years. I have talked to other musicians as well who have had that, I guess stigma is a good word uh, against them about becoming a musician. And how did you overcome that? What was the moment that you finally said, no, this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to do it and I'm going to make a life. Um, I never overcame that <laughs> because I, oh, uh, the, the way I'm saying this is because that prevailed. It was mm. until Maybe after high school, I, I was starting vet medicine while at the oh. same time taking flu lessons with my teacher when I was, when I graduated from college. So, I, well, parenthesis, at that time in Guadalajara, there was no uh, music major uh, a, a college at university okay. to study music. Right. It was like a technical mm -hmm. degree of three years. It was not a, a, a bachelor's diploma. 
Sure. So I studied that and I went to study vet medicine okay. and I continued playing. So I joined the uh, military band in Mexico, in Guadalajara. So I was playing the piccolo in the band. Mm. So I was proving, I didn't do it to prove to my family that, but I had a job right. uh, making money playing music and with the uniform and haircut like a military. So I was like, ooh, like right. different. No? So right. my family got to appreciate that actually what I was doing, I could get money sure. by playing music and in the army, not just like corner musicians. So the image they have like mariachi, I'm right. not saying that mariachis are bad or right. the mariachi musicians are bad or the right. drug. No, that, that's not true. Right. But people think that in Mexico, hey, I play the guitar, a sombrero, and you just strings and tequila. Right. And that's not a musician. Right. No, right. that's an image. Right. There are excellent mariachis in Mexico. Yes. <laughs> so it wasn't until my 20s when I, when I was earning money playing music. And then I was playing with a friend from school in a French restaurant in Guadalajara, ah. gigs at night. So I was making more money. Okay. So I started buying, I bought a mountain bike, I buy a stereo. Uh, I bought personal things that I wanted with my own money. So like my family, like, okay, he's playing music. <laughs> so, so they kind of left me alone with that uh, idea, crazy idea, me playing music. <laughs> and I think that's a very common experience, unfortunately. Um, but that's why I, I think that your story is so important to share uh, with others because I think there are many who feel like, um, you know, oh, if you go do music, it's just a hobby. It's just a hobby. And you can do that in your free time. Yeah, so. And and what are you going to do with a music degree? What are you going to do with music? It's never going to uh, make you money. Same with artists <laughs> of any kind. <laughs> so yeah, can I, yeah, yeah. can I ask, um, what has helped you discern the difference between someone else's true encouragement for you versus maybe an expectation they have for you? Like if they have an expectation and they give you some advice and they want you to go do something, how do you, how have you been able to tell whether or not you should follow that advice or whether that advice is actually meant for you or is actual encouragement for what you want to do? Maybe I, um, I hope not many young people follow what is perceived as an advice. Uh, mm -hmm. If I follow what my uncle say about me, and I don't even want to say <laughs> uh, the idea that me playing flute, like that was for girls. He mm -hmm. said in the worst way. He didn't say that. He didn't say, well, I don't want to say it. But, sure. um, and not because the, the flute is a, is a feminine instrument, but just because Oh, parenthesis, okay. The idea, uh, my, fa my father was a baker, I right. say that. And some of my uncles were, they work like uh, like with auto parts, not mechanics, but right, with right. Uh, business with mechanics. So they, a, a man is supposed to like work hard and dirty and be dirty and with their hands, like my father, right. you know, bakery and bakery, yeah, right. you get dirty. So me playing something with my hands is like, no. <laughs> so, um, I didn't follow that and it was very difficult, but at the same time, I want to say that I didn't follow my dream, but I think looking back is, I, I don't think it was because there was no opportunity for that, not for me, mm. because there was no a music school that had like a degree in music. I had to go to another city or another country. So I continued playing. I did not abandon that dream, but at that time, it was not possible. So I was able to do, I don't finish that medicine. I started other things later, uh, <laughs> but I continued playing just because I loved it and because I liked it. And also because flute is a very easy instrument to carry. Yeah. So it was very easy for me to, to play in the restaurants and to carry with me. Right. And it was not big. And so it was, um, Maybe it was fear, or I don't know what it was that didn't allow me to really pursue a Korean music. But if I wanted to do that at that time, I had to go back again in another city or country. So sure. Guadalajara was not that much at that time. Right. At that time. I'm talking about mid 80s, mid 80s, maybe. Yeah. 
And so have you always just known what you were meant to do and followed that? I, I think so, uh, in a way, because I started playing recorder when I was eight years old, mm. and it was not even mine. It was my older and older brother, and because they asked him that for school, but he just like three months or whatever, he left the flute. The flute was like a toy in the house, so sure. I grab it and I start playing, and I start learning, and I took some classes, some kind of com Sunday community classes in what mm -hmm. I had for recorder. Mm -hmm. So I went to the classes. That's when I started learning how to read music. I was maybe 11 years old, mm. 12, but, but in the recorder. And then when I was about 16 uh, in the pawn shop, <laughs> there you go. my oldest brother saw it, what he thought was a flute because we never... Right, it's right. Flute like this. Um, the, the recorder is called flute in, in Spanish. The recorder yes. is flute. Right. So it's flute. Flauta dulce, flauta transversal. Ah. So uh, my family page, my brother, my mother, and they bought me this flute metal thing, but I didn't know how to play it. So I put it on my shoulder and because <laughs> I didn't have a teacher. Right. And I found in the music store, those books, maybe you are familiar with those, those sure. easy play, they kind of like the yes. big note with a letter F or A. Yes. Or a big. So it was in the two pages like this at the beginning, mm -hmm. it was how to play the flute just in two pages. Can you imagine? That? It was just that. Yeah. And it was a carpenter's book. Uh, so I was maybe 15 and I didn't even know the carpet, carpenter songs. Maybe close to you, but I don't know who the carpenters were. So the book was in English and I didn't uh, read English. So right, in right. two pages, was only two pages was instructions how to blow the flute, how to put the finger in the notes. So I started learning that myself. Wow. So I was doing like this, putting <laughs> the flute like that. Over your shoulder. And really, I don't know how, I don't know that you had to do like this. I like had to, right, so, right. like, I guess. And so, then I, I knew later there was a music school in Guadalajara. I went there, I asked for information, and I found this professor was there. So there is an exam, still this exam that happened in Guadalajara. Uh, it's called a curso propedeutico. Mm -hmm. It's like a month uh, theory, music, theory, music training oh, class, sure. and then they have the exam. So they evaluate students if they have ear training right. and right. rhythm to, to select the students so i failed the exam oh. i didn't have any musical skills yeah oh, no. i failed the exam so like, ah. i tried the <laughs> following year and i think i passed with a d i think okay. so i was like Psh. i think i tried twice and yeah and my family and nobody's musical but mm -hmm. uh, i think most of my siblings i turned deaf really yeah and and i mean maybe i was too i uh, maybe i still am but <laughs> I, I i i wanted to do it i wanted yeah. but i had no support of my family so it yeah. was very difficult and there is no this is something that um maybe will come or come later in the conversation but we don't have music education in mexico like here right. in the united states or europe that right kids from elementary school they have those like choir orchestra band and then later if you want to keep going with music yes or not but we don't right. have that in mexico so right. we have to go to a different school to study right. music so that was that's the reason it was a little difficult for me yeah and it, so ha, i just have so many questions that i didn't even you know put in the questions ahead of time but um my then my question is is that part of what fuels your not only your passion for what you do but your desire to give back and teach and teach in guadalajara still Yes, um, and I think I've been lucky and, and blessed that I teach at the university what I was studying before it was the major. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about what I teach. Maybe mm -hmm. it can fit during this, this, this question. Yeah. I don't really, um, the class that I teach at the music school is called Inglés Aplicado a la Música, which is English Applied to Music. And the English as Second Language courses or linguistics field, this class is called English for Specific Purpose. Right. So I teach college level students music theory, but it's like an engineer student and a college of engineering or physics 
taking elementary school math level, right. but in a different language. Right. So it's like that. My students are uh, performance majors, all instruments and voices. Not every semester I have all, but sure. I have bassoons and cellos and the other. Uh, composition majors, conducting majors, and music education majors. So they know more about music theory than I do. They play better that now now there is a yeah. college degree, a right. diploma of violin performance or oboe performance. They play better and more virtuous virtuous with more virtuosity than I do. Right, right. Uh, because I didn't study music as a major. Right. I study linguistics. My my degree is in linguistics, but it happens that I learn music. I went to the University of Texas mm -hmm. and I studied linguistics and I played the marching band. I played right. uh, all, all in some. I just want to be part of the university, right. American university spirit or feeling. I wanted to leave that. So I learned of music theory and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I teach again, uh, elementary, element, no, basic music theory sure. um, and music history but in a different language. Right. And I believe that's very important. So I, I, I have admired some of my students because they, they're really like, like the level of any student anywhere else. Some are just magnificent players or singers. And sometimes I feel a little intimidated because I don't play like them or yeah. I don't sing like them. And, but <laughs> hey, I'm the English teacher. I'm the English teacher. <laughs> yeah. So it's, or, or class is a lot of fun because we get to talk about music and teach about music, but again, a different language. And it's important because now with this much uh, mobility international, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, right. uh, professors, master classes, it's right. easier for students to go overseas. So professors coming to Guadalajara for master classes, right. any professor from any country to come to Guadalajara, they speak the language, uh, Japanese or in English. So most probably that masterclass is going to be in English. Right. And English terminology and music is very difficult. It's yes. very technical. Yes. It's very specific. And if you don't know the word in, in another language, it's just, it's just an example, uh, the pickup note. So mm. if you're taking a class, masterclass in Spanish, and I'm talking about pickup note, it's anacruza. Mm, that has nothing right. to do with pickup. So anacruza, pickup. Right. So right. if the student don't know that pickup is anacruza, that you know. Right. So second ending, a segunda casilla. All this terminology, the students need to know that. Now with programs like finales, Sibelius, they need to do, know this terminology and how to talk about music. Yes. And it's very important. And I have a lot of fun working with real musicians, even though they're yeah. students, yeah. Uh, with uh, with performers and, and composers, young performers, young composers, and me teaching them about music theory. You know? right. We have a lot of fun. And again, everything is so difficult. The names of the notes, okay? In English, whole, half. And uh, right. the Spanish is redonda, blanca, negra, like round, white, black, and you know, those are the names of the notes. Yeah. Even that, some students, if they don't know the names of those notes, they're, they're, they're lost. Now, uh, 18th century is gone. So Italian, the, uh, the language for music yes. is no longer Italian, it's, it's English. So 18th century is gone. Mm -hmm. And and if you buy a music course now or, or tutorials, or, a lot of people, a lot of uh, people talking about music, they use English terms like slurred right. or uh, second ending. They use this terminology. No, they don't right. use the Italian. They use lega, legato, maybe some, but usually you, you're going to have English terminology and music now. And the students need to learn that. So it's, it's vital. It's important for them to know that as young musicians. Yeah. That's a great point that I don't think a lot of musicians really think about is how they need to be able to understand musical notation and understand terms and symbols, not only in their own language, but in other languages as well. So that is a great point. I do want to share, you sent some pictures Incorrect. of the school in Guadalajara, and I do want to share a couple of pictures so that people can see uh, on the video. If you're watching the podcast on YouTube, you'll see these pictures 
And uh, if you're listening, I'll try to describe some of the pictures. We'll try to be very descriptive, but I'll also try to post a link where you'll, you'll be able to find these pictures if you're listening to the podcast. So this is the outside of the school, correct? Yeah, this is the, the sculpture that is on the right is Beethoven. There is a oh, Beethoven okay. as on the, on the right. You, you just, yeah. And the other one is our medieval composer, somebody, I don't know what it is, it's a garden. Okay. Okay. Uh, and this school, is, you can see the building is very old. Yes. So this building was built in 1573. Wow. That's when it was built. It was a convent. So next to the church, um, another picture or another the link that you're going to send, it's a church, it's the Church of San Agustin. Oh, that's the okay. patio, that's inside the school. Right. That's inside the school. So the architecture is, is beautiful. Yes, um, I mean, the columns are but, all beautiful columns and then wonderful archways and balconies and patios. It's gorgeous. Yes, the problem is, it's not very functional for a music school. Right. <laughs> uh, the classrooms are are okay in the way that the ceiling is very the ceiling is very high. So mm. when uh, students are like rehearsing the, something choral, sizing, it sounds like echoey. Like right. it was a convent, right? So it sounds like very echoey that the right. school is a square with uh, three floors, the patio, and it is beautiful. And the columns are from like 1500s. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's really nice, but it's not, see, in this picture, you can see the students playing and the hallways and the patios because right. we have maybe, I'll say 20, 20 uh, practice rooms mm. for 600 students. It's not wow. enough. Yeah. Again, it's, it's not very functional. So you see two bass, guitar, oboe, everybody practice. Right. So it's very noisy. Right. <laughs> so the secretary is <laughs> like, shut up. You know? <laughs> when everybody's playing the trombo, when the trumpets and trumpet players are playing the patio. Right. Uh, but you're right. In a, in a building, they want to practice, they right. want to play. In a building that was built in 1573, it's not like you can soundproof, right? Uh, you can't really add a lot of the modern things Correct. to, yeah. yeah. So, um, and then this last picture, Correct. it looks like from a concert. Yeah, this, uh, I, want, I want to share this picture because some of the students at the music school, they teach uh, in the program now, uh, the government, I'm parenthesis now, I'm going to explain a little bit uh, about this picture. There's a programs now for uh, music education for children. Mm. And usually they're in neighborhoods and areas of the city. They have some challenges, mm -hmm. you know, with uh, maybe youth at risk for different reasons. So they're bringing these programs to the communities to mm. encourage kids to to do something artistic right. and it's been very successful this program so now some of my students they're the teachers of these uh schools oh, there are several sure. there are different programs okay. one is called fundacion fundacion azteca again we don't have elementary school right uh, music institute as a part of the education but we right. have these other programs that if you're parent if you want to bring your kid there then you bring your kid there and they take classes for free so it's, it's not a way to compensate. But this is new. Maybe it has 10 years, maybe. Mm. Uh, no, no more than 12, I think. But this is new program. This is a new program. And it just for looks... For teaching kids music. It looks fabulous. It looks like, a, you know, a wonderful program. And it looks just... Uh, again, I will put pictures into some sort of drive or link where um, listeners, if you're listening to this, you can go and uh, click on the show notes and find those links for the pictures. It's beautiful. Yeah, this kind of program has been successful, successful in other countries. Venezuela ha mm -hmm. has it, um, Colombia, uh, where the government provides uh, these kind of programs for areas of the city where there's more risk for kids or young people. And it's a way to help change that um, generation through artistic uh, programs. And now these kids are singing choirs and playing mm -hmm. symphony orchestras and, and uh, giving concerts and touring. 
And usually it's the kids that uh, otherwise wouldn't have opportunity like this because right. the families cannot afford something like that. Right. But now uh, some of my students are teachers in these programs. And, you know, I, I, like a lot of other music educators, believe that there is nothing more hopeful and nothing more wonderful in a community than to have children performing and participating in the arts, whether it's theater or music oh, or other art programs. It's just such an important part of the communities that we live in. And when we are supporting yes. those um, events and that type of education, it's just such a critical part. It, it, I feel like it not only brings communities together, but also gives people hope. Yes. Yes, correct. It's true. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, COVID and how the pandemic, you know, might have affected what you have been able to do. Um, you know, no one has, <laughs> this is the first time any of us have been through a global pandemic. And for a lot of people, it was very devastating. And I'm curious to know, how did you stay hopeful? How did you stay creative? And what did you do to keep moving forward? Thank you. Um, I'll try to be brief <laughs> because a lot of things happen. Yeah. So as I said already, I was, I'm an English teacher at the mm -hmm. music school. So I had, a, it's not a regular English second language classes, as I already said, right. it's more focused on, on music. Right. But uh, to cover this grammar thing, so I think I to cover, I had a lot of uh, board games, mm. but for learning English, right. I, this is what when I was teaching uh, uh, classes in person at the sure. school. So one of the homeworks that I ask every group and every year when I had the new students, like an index card, well, this is bigger than index card, but sure. index card to draw or paste uh, a picture of a person or an animal, like two people or and two things. So every student had to bring four index cards with two with the pictures of a person doing whatever the person is doing random just random or two things sure. it could be an apple a tree a bicycle sure. weights whatever so i collected that four from each student i was a semester that i had 100 students so i had a lot of cards yeah so i will mix them this is when i was teaching a life i'll mix them and i will uh, set teams like four or five and I give them a bunch of cards and they had to create a story. So I had to start with the person. So I say, whoever has a person, they have to start. So this is Juanita and mm -hmm. she's going to, but, and the next person put the next card. If you had an apple or a tree or a seed, they had to say like a tail, right. but they were improvising. It sounds right. easy, but this is people who are English learners mm -hmm. and they had to say that in English. Sometimes they don't know how to say the verb, for example, swimming. Yeah, maybe they know, but other verbs will be more difficult. Shopping, right. for example, maybe they don't know that word. Right. So they had to create a tale, a story. So the class was always fun and dynamic. We play like word search. Uh, oh, uh, sure. Board, always related things to music. We play in the patio. I was moving. It was very nice. Very, I, we sing because every classroom had a piano. Mm. We sing a song from ABBA or BGS or Beatles. That's <laughs> kind of like resting time after right, right. 40 minutes. I'll let's stand up and sing a song. And then COVID hit. So all the material that I had, my board games, dice, uh, cards, mm -hmm. like, um, yeah, like casino right. type of cards, right. all these things that I had to do games, like what I'm going to do with these things. And I was very sad yeah. because some of the material I and it was in our strike with things you do online. So, um, should I mention some of the sites that I used uh, sure. for online things? It's, sure. It's, I, I forgot to ask you. Okay. So everyone, most people know Kahoot. So mm -hmm. I created a lot of Kahoot uh, games. Right. And also there's another one that is called Gather. And I like Gather because the students can choose with whom to talk. So that helped me uh, uh, to alleviate the just looking at me for two hours. Right. So uh, <laughs> that was good. So another thing, and, and James, our friend that you mentioned, yes. he was part of this before. I I had guests in my class from all over oh. to interview my students right. to interview them. So I had an orchestra conductor from London, 
Mm. I had a flute player from Germany. Uh, I had a choir conductor. He's from the United States, but right now he lives in Mexico. So all okay. these interviews in English. Yeah. Again, all the things that I'm telling you that I did, it may sound not, not much like a big deal, but again, these are English learners. Yeah. So some students have like very basic English uh, and, and then others can ask a little more elaborate questions, but mm -hmm. it was not just a talk. It was an English class. Yeah. So that was very successful. And to maintain the, the students to motivate, I had to uh, give them assignments that they could do, uh, they could present online. For example, right. one of the games that we did on Zoom, they had to uh, 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 pairs and they had to describe, um, oh, one of the assignments was to draw a monster, like a cartoon <laughs> monster. Sure. So they had to describe the monster to a partner. So the partner was to, supposed to draw this monster right. and they had to show uh, on the camera, right. the original, the one that I right. draw and I describe to my partner and my partner, but all this in English. So they had to know uh -huh. the body parts. Some students didn't know how to say horns or tail, sure. furry. So they didn't know these words. So they were learning these words uh, at the same time, having a laugh and, mm -hmm. and, and learning words. And what I did uh, uh, this semester, all the things that I've done, because I wanted, uh, so they wanted, I want them to talk about music, is they had to describe, for example, my favorite musical moment. Mm. So again, in English. Right. So they had to speak for one minute. They had to talk about music and describe a clip of 10 minutes, 15 minutes, why this uh, guitar solo by Slash, they like it. Why this <laughs> drum solo by right. the guy Metallica, so whatever. Right. Right. And they had, to, and it's difficult for them to describe in another language why that part is musically with musical terms, why mm -hmm. they like that. So they, I learned a lot from them because some guys show some singers from Hungary or Russia singers that I didn't know. Right. So that was very good. Also, another homework is to uh, talk about the music genre that is already gone, like oh, uh, right. disco, punk, funk. Uh, and they had to give a PowerPoint presentation, no more than 10 minutes, the history, uh, the, uh, how this genre came to a grunge, for example, and how what happened when they died. Mm. So they had to do this research. Wow. Again, they has to be done in another language. Yeah. And some get very nervous <laughs> yeah. because they had to speak so all this is online. The, the, uh, one of the homework that even so kept me motivated um, that I was part of this too is um, something more like personal. They have nothing much to do with music, but with English is um, the, with the word pies, P-I-E-S. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, the, um, with a P means uh, physical, I intellectual, E spiritual, and S social. Okay. So they had to choose like a goal right. uh, of those, like a stretch, like a goal for a week or two weeks. And I told them, this is not a therapy group. This is not, if you do it in Spanish, then you miss the purpose of it because this is not psychology, psychologically coaching right, homework. Right. It's English homework. Because by doing this homework, they had to speak in past tense and that's difficult for many mm -hmm. students. Yes. So they had to choose a partner and tell them, okay, my physical, uh, physical, I got to run three times a week. And then they had to report to the partner the following week if they did it or not. So I, and I was part of that homework. So that kept my students and uh, myself kind of like doing exercise for a week or two yeah. or reading a book <laughs> or something because we just, we just bored, you know? Yeah. So that was a very nice homework. And this semester I tried to do it, but it was not very successful because now the school is back uh, presential, not me because right. I'm in Minnesota. But uh, it was easier to do these kind of activities during COVID. These goals, these personal goals, right. a stretch, 
And some students got very into it. Some invite their group, their partners, their girlfriends or boyfriends to do this, to do it together. Oh, it wow. was very nice. It created more like a, a very a, a intimate uh, bonding, even yeah. though we were online. Yeah. Some students they didn't know each other. They never saw each other before. Yeah. And they're talking about in, in, in separate groups. I told them, I don't, I don't need to know if Luis... He read the book that he said he was going to read 30 minutes every day. I don't need to know. It's just between you two. Right. If you don't do, if you didn't do it, you, uh, you have to then explain them how to process that, how to explain about it. But it's just between these two. And some like became like friends, you know, they didn't yeah. know each other. They never saw each other. <laughs> and they were talking about these things. That was very nice. I really like uh, that too. So I had to come up with, things i was relying a lot of um uh, physical things like cards mm -hmm. toys board games dice and now it's like everything here yeah <laughs> so i had to come up with different things but uh, uh thankfully there are like some sites like gather or yeah. or kahoot that they can help yeah uh, this uh online teaching but it sounds but like your times, students uh, really I kept to... you motivated and creative. Your students really, you know. Oh yeah, you. I. Yes, uh, another, oh another homework that I did is the the song challenge. They had to sing at least two verses of a song in English again that they consider very difficult. Mm. So what whether the music education uh, grows, you know, very theme pretty looks like her. she sang a, a system of the down song i think it was chapstick some a song that was like very difficult okay. to, to say even in the, for english speakers and she was singing the, and she did a very very good so they really practice those songs uh okay and i told her it's gotta be at your level yeah. if for you yellow submarine is difficult Mm -hmm. You've seen Yellow Submarine. Is this not a contest? This is not who sings better. Right. This is not who sings the most difficult song. No, it's the song that is difficult for you in English because the speed or the words or the pronunciation. Right. So it was a lot of fun because they had to sing the song here. And because they're musicians, some even play in the piano. Oh, you know, wow. The, yeah. the, the, the songs. Yeah. Another homework that we had is they had to, well, I did a presentation of, uh, plagiarism and, mm. and ripoff songs. Right. I did a present or, uh, the presentation that. So the homework was to change the lyrics of a song mm. and came up with their own words, uh, make it like a, a funny song, the same right. melody and just changing the lyrics. So they were very, oh, some students, they really did a wonderful things. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. So we had to do different things. And I think a lot of teachers had that similar experience. I know I did online when I flipped my studio. It was hard. You had to work, you know, but eventually we got into it. And I had so many fun uh, classes and, and interactions with students. It, it really was, it improved my teaching overall. So I feel like I can sort of relate. Yeah, I didn't have yes. as many students as you do. <laughs> <clears throat> For someone who is... Well, I have four groups. And we're like, yeah, yeah. For someone who is watching or listening and, you know, we're... This is um, May 2022 right now when we're recording this interview. And so largely pandemic is over and we're moving. Most places are opening up. Travel is less restricted. Vaccines are available <clears throat> and things are opening up and th people are a little more free and less fearful, less scared. And yet there are still people who are struggling in their teaching, who are struggling in their businesses, who are struggling as musicians. What encouragement would you want to offer people who might be listening or watching? Something that I did, again, I'm not, I don't consider myself a performer. Uh, I don't play symphony orchestra, something like that, or gigs much. Mm -hmm. But something that I did, and it's something similar, I'm not a runner or an athlete either, but something <laughs> that I did, I'm going to come from like running. Uh, I registered for a race like six months in advance and pay for it. Mm. So then I had to train. I had to run. Right. So what I did and is uh, I, I'm very fortunate, as I explained earlier, that uh, to know very talented musicians and to uh, know them, they're my students. So I invited them to play with me. 
something. Ah. So I was sending them music. And of course, they were very happy because they're playing with their teacher, I guess. Yeah. Because I never had a student say no. So, but for me, it was a way to force myself to practice. Mm -hmm. If I didn't do this and I was not playing or chaos or nothing, then I'll be like my flute to be collecting dust. Yeah. So we get to record some, some songs and we made some videos uh, two years ago, like Christmas videos. So now I had this goal, like in a month or two, I'm going to record with this violin player, which I think he is very, very good. Okay. And he's like in his early 20s and I'm like in my 50s right. and, and, and he plays <laughs> my little. So I don't want, I, and I'm the one inviting him to play with right, me. Right. And I'm like, right. I don't want to be like, oh, wait a second, let me, this passage. So I had to study very hard. So that kept me very motivated, uh, inviting someone to play with me. Mm. And usually I didn't, I didn't have people who say no. I didn't buy a lot. I wish yeah. I did it more, mm. but I'm glad I did it a couple of times. And at work, we, we recorded some videos and very nice sh shots and places. Sure. And, uh, some of my students have the very basic homemade <laughs> recording studios just the right, computer right. on the microphone pretty much. Right. And, but they knew how to edit and that sounded very good. And uh, that was, for me, it was a blessing. And I was mm. very fortunate to play with some of these kids. Uh, yeah. And that I wish I'd do that again more. Even now, you can do this long distance because uh, they, the student can record their part of some yes. the friend's house or, and I can record my part and then somebody can edit it those two parts. So it was it was very nice doing that you know, with my students. So that helped me to keep my spirit, musical spirits up. Sure. Not my athletic spirits because <laughs> yeah. I was not exercising <laughs> at all. Like when I was saying that I was running, but uh, it was it was very nice to do this with my students. It's so interesting that you so mentioned that. that's something that people can do. Yeah, because I have recitals this week in my studio and uh, my studio recitals, we have a concert hall that I rent and I have a lot more duets and ensembles playing this year than any other time. And I, I'm doing the same thing. I'm practicing and I'm getting all of my music ready. And some of my students are so good. And I'm like, wait, I, I got to practice. <laughs> I gotta keep up, <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. but, but I love it and I wouldn't trade it, you know, and the, the things that they're doing, they're arranging yeah, pop correct. songs, they're writing their own music. They're, you know, asking me to help them arrange yeah, exactly. ensemble yeah. music and we get to perform it together. And it is such a huge boost in one spirit to create and to collaborate and to perform again with one another. I think, you know, during lockdown, it was harder to do the recording, but still at least it was an opportunity. And we learned how to do it. We learned how to use the technology. And now that things are yeah, opening up, yeah. I agree. I think the being back to ensemble playing is just um, such a such an encouragement, su such an experience of of joy. <laughs> I don't know how else to, ex to describe it. Yes, yeah, yeah. the joy, exactly, yeah. 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 blessing a joy yeah. is this it's very nice yeah that's wonderful that's a, a wonderful encouragement to people and a great segue to the first song that you would like to share here for your top five songs of encouragement so i'm going to share the screen and we are going to hear this first piece which is uh sonata in f ba major by telemon and this is you and your students correct correct okay. so we play in a museum this is a museum and okay yeah, let me play this and then I'm gonna let you talk about it. Here we go. Okay. Okay. I wish we could play the whole thing, but this, uh, this will be linked in the show notes. So yeah. go listen to the whole piece. It's so beautifully, so okay. well done. Thank you. Thank you. It was difficult. And we, we got this and maybe in three weeks. Wow. Uh, these students, again, as I was telling you, I invited my students and they're like, okay. And the guitar player, he really did his part. I was a cello player, but he, the guitar player had like more things, I think, technically. And uh, 
it, we're in the museum. Somebody had like a pro go camera. That's why it looks mm. the wall looks like round. Right. So I don't even notice that the camera was in a chair. <laughs> Somebody uploaded this in the YouTube. I don't, I found out about this like months later. <laughs> so the camera was in a in a chair and the front, and it was like I don't even know that something that yeah. was being filmed. So uh, I got a call to play in this uh, recital because the person who was scheduled to perform canceled, mm. and I was called like two weeks before three, and I say yes. And unbeknownst to me, and not knowing that I somebody called me, somebody called the guitar player too, invited him to the recital. Okay. Then I'm like, well, I already, and I was thinking of inviting him to play with me. It was pretty funny okay. because okay. somebody called him, somebody called me. When they right. called me, I thought, okay, maybe I can invite him because he's, right. he's a good student. I know him right. is reliable. He was a yes. And it happens that, that for the same concert, we both got a call. Oh. So we put a program together. He played more things. Uh, so like he, because he had more pieces the guitar solo and the cello player was my student too uh, his name is Julio and the guitar player Miguel but they were my my English students and we performed I'm playing the piccolo on this piece I play some uh, pieces of piccolo this place is for flute but it sounded very cool the piccolo and I want to play piccolo so I yeah. play the piccolo yeah but yeah I got the chance to I feel very fortunate to play with good musicians like them for free they don't charge me <laughs> and 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 uh, we have fun, you know. They they want to play with me because I'm their teacher. I want to play with them because they're my students. Yeah, and it was it's very nice. Yeah. Oh, just and just fabulous, fabulous music. We're gonna move to the next clip. This is Bach, and just one of the most gorgeous pieces, uh, the Concerto for Violin, Oboe, and Strings in D Minor. Again, go listen to this whole thing. Click on the show notes for the link. We're going to pick this up at the beginning and just hear a little clip of it. hate to stop these such a beautiful recording i loved listening yeah, to this, this so morning it's a beautiful conversation it's mm -hmm. a conversation it's a dialogue between the violin and the oboe they're conversing they're mm -hmm. responding this they will talk and start finishing talking the other instruments are talking it's just beautiful and then they like together and then again this oh it's just just beautiful it is and inspiring it's for, for, for me this for me. yeah this morning it was just very calming and it just reminded me why i love chamber music yeah. so much yes yes that's him here this next piece that we're going to hear is the uh oboe concerto in d minor this is the adagio movement and this is alessandro marcello or marcello how do you pronounce that Marcello, Marcello, Marcello. Yeah. yes. Uh, also, again, by Bach. So this is um, just about 20 seconds or so in. We'll hear just a little clip. And again, go listen to the whole thing. Click on the link in the show notes and you'll hear the whole thing. have to stop it there it's very beautiful the whole concerto is very beautiful yes talk about that one why is that one encouraging to you um it gives me uh same like the previous one it gives me a lot of peace and it sets me and like if i feel discouraged mm -hmm. for some reason or frustrated or nervous or something this uh piece these two pieces lift me mm -hmm. uh, more like in a more like in the spiritual level yeah so i feel i don't feel like yeah i'm gonna run this uh, yeah. marathon not that kind of of strength but more like believing that I can do something or believing yeah. in something better, hoping for something better. And it brings out uh, nice feelings, uh, positive feelings, uh, uplifting feelings. You know, I don't know, it's just, uh, I don't know how to say words, but it just sets me by, if I'm like frustrated or whatever, too many things to do, it just sets me to like, 
Yes, I, the word I was going to say earlier. Yes, yeah, the word I was going to say earlier is I felt very centered when I listened this morning. I felt centered. Center. That's a word. That's a word. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, center. Yeah, that's a word. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, wonderful. Uh, not only a wonderful orchestration um, and wonderful presentation of that, but it's a gorgeous, gorgeous piece. We're going to move on to the next one. This is Bellini, and oh my goodness. <laughs> Go listen to the whole thing. This is actually not very long. We're going to pick it up just before the two minute mark here. This is from Norma, Act One, Costa Diva. And uh, we'll hear a little bit of the vocalist here, but go listen to this whole track um, after you listen to this interview and just enjoy this whole thing. Here's a tiny little clip. Mm. There's so much more to enjoy, but talk about that one. Yes, it's a very, uh, you see the strings, it's just like playing like arpeggios, very, very soft. The melody is not those like, I, I love opera and I love the soprano, virtual soprano, but, but it's not like okay. traviata, yeah. singing, uh, all crazy, yeah. uh, high. Go like, this, the melody is just so soothing mm -hmm. and kind of like sad. And it has a the, the virtuoso part of these areas when it goes very high, but it's not like a traviata high with right, a right. lot of like right. ornaments. Yeah. Uh, this is just piano, it's just the melody again, it's soothing, it's just beautiful. It's, it's like just to enjoy looking at nothing. Yeah. It's, it's just very, very inspiring too. Yeah. yeah. Not good for driving for me. If I'm driving, I'll go just drive straight. <laughs> if I'm driving a car, I don't think I can do it. I'll be like lost listening to this piece. And yeah, it's just, it, it just transport, transports me to, to another stage that I like to be. Yeah, so it's not relaxed, not, and not while yeah. driving. <laughs> and I think, you know, what a great, I'm so glad you mentioned that because I now want to, I want to go listen to that again, but I also kind of want to meditate, you know, and just do that exactly. Think Correct. about nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So beautiful. We're going to move on to this last one. This last clip is uh, from Mozart. And uh, this is the Laudate Dominum. And my... Uh, Latin is not great either, but we're going to pick this up about one minute in, but go listen to the whole thing. There's so many great sections to this particular piece, and we're just going to listen to a little bit here. to stop that <laughs> yes <laughs> talk about that one is is this one is and this is, is more like a spiritual it's a religious piece mm -hmm. but uh it, it also same thing it's just like to me for me it's like to meditate to be centered and all the pieces i just realized that all the pieces that i chose are like calming you know something like very and calming and and this piece same like um a like casta diva mm. the voice is not very like the other other famous soprano areas by mozart yeah it's completely different but it's same it's just so calming in the inside yeah like uh, I had the pleasure to listen to this uh, live in the church in the cathedral of Guadalajara, oh. which is a very old and beautiful cathedral. Wow. Singing with an orchestra and a soprano there, it was just, I was, oh. I was like, it was, I was very moved. Yeah. yeah. Very, yeah. very beautiful, a spiritual piece. And I'm so glad you brought that up because I had a similar reaction just listening to the recording this morning. Uh, and just it's so it's named the solemn vespers for a uh, confessor and that idea of solemn vespers uh was very it was in my head as i was listening and i too was not only calm but it drew out emotions in me 
that I was like, wow, mm -hmm. this is really hitting me in a way that I'm just so full of gratitude. I'm, I'm going to confess something. <laughs> I was driving once with my family uh, in California, freeway Saturday, a lot of traffic, whatever. Mm. And I had a city in this space camera and I was completely lost. And I was moved, I was moved a little while I was driving. And I said uh, to the people who were in the car, I want this piece to be sang at my funeral. Oh. I told them that. And that was like, uh, 15 years ago, maybe, and I still I want the piece to be sung in my funeral. <laughs> this particular with the soprano, this one, wow. yeah, well, among others, but this one is just very, very moving. Yeah. Wow! Now I understand why that is such a powerful piece for you. It's amazing. Yes. Mm. Wow. It is. It is. Before I let you go today, is there anything else that you would like to share with the listeners, any other encouragement or anything else that you would like to leave our listeners with? Um, I am just an honor being here and talking with you and um, this opportunity that I had to, to mention the things that I said. And I think uh, when I feel this courage, uh, I like to listen to something like, this or something more virtuoso, but in a way that for me, like, wow, I need to practice. You know? <laughs> right. I, I, if you if you notice, I didn't share anything but flute players because I yeah. envy them. I, no, 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 I envy them, but they're more music than just flute for me. You know, they're beautiful music. Yeah. And and for me, I, uh, Cecilia Bartoli is singing uh, mm. Agitata da Dua Venti. I think that's a very difficult, I try to play my flute and even for flute it's difficult for voice, I cannot imagine. Yeah. And she sings it with so easy, easiness, like yeah. me, like when I sneeze, so right. easy for her, like doing all these ornaments <laughs> and, yeah. and like how she can do this. So I listened to that, that, oops, I think I need to practice my scales or my arpeggios <laughs> or something. And, and I think uh, for me, what works for me, if I just focus on my flute, and I want to play motor concerto, lesson to motor concerto. I just get so, like, I feel like so much pressure, like, oh, I cannot play like that. I cannot play, it's just like, or my students, if I listen to some flute students, I get like intimidated by that. Mm -hmm. But if I listen to other beautiful music, that is not my instrument, then I feel like, oh, I want to read that. And yeah. I get the, the music score for a violin piece or for oboe, and then I play my flute parts. Yeah. So I think uh, it, what works for me, if I feel, unmotivated, discouraged or whatever. I play some, I, I love music. And if you're a musician, it's because you love music. Right. But it, it, if it, I might have a lack of motivation, I play something else that has nothing to do with my instrument. Ah. I had a lot of ar or arias, uh, opera arias, sure, and I play sure. the flute. Uh, and just because I like the melodies, Mozart and Traviata and Carmen, and I'm playing the parts of the contralto, the right. soprano, just for fun. And then I get to play my uh, exercise for flute. Right. But then I feel like, wow, it was very nice what I did. Yeah. And that, that helps me a lot. For me, that works. I don't know if that may work for somebody else. But if I'm just focused on how difficult it, I have this amazing time. I had to play this third movement by Friday. And uh, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. I feel frustrated because other things are happening in my life. I enjoy play. Music should be to be enjoyed. So yeah. enjoy play something else. Yeah. And then that one. For me, that works. For yeah. me, that works. <laughs> you know, and such great advice because I I noticed when I was putting together my recital programs for this week and you know, printing everything, I looked at the selections of music and I, I was sort of like, oh, I have a little of everything. We have some classical, we have some contemporary lyrical, we have just some easy, fun little folk tune duets. Uh, we have some really difficult classical music. I have students who are playing pop music and who have written their own, you know, pop songs. We, ha it's just, it's like I was surprised and I was like, wow, this is going to be fun. And I am so looking forward yeah. to this, not just because I'm proud as a proud teacher, but I was so excited about the variety and thinking, oh, I think this is really going to be fun for the audience. It's going to be fun for me, but I think it's really going to be fun for the audience to hear all different types of music in one recital. And because I'm playing so many ensemble pieces, 
I kind of feel the same way as I've been practicing and getting ready for these recitals this week. You know, what a joy it is for me also to go from, you know, a, a Debussy piece um, to a modern day uh, pop song arrangement. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's very nice. It's very nice. That's, yeah. I like that. I think that's excellent advice is for us to broaden ourselves a little bit and listen to other music, play other music, explore. Now is a great time for that. Yes. Yes. Well, thank yes. you again so much for joining me today for doing this interview thank for you. Sounds of thank Encouragement. You. Uh, if you are listening to or watching this interview, please check out all the show notes and you can find out more about Gerardo and what he does and where he teaches in Guadalajara and all the things that he is doing, including all the links to all those top five songs of encouragement that you just heard. And as always, if you need encouragement, please reach out to me personally at soundofencouragement at gmail.com. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening. Please click on the show notes to learn more about my guest and to listen to their top songs of encouragement. If you have found value in these podcasts, please share the podcast with those you know, leave a positive review, or support the show at buymeacoffee.com. Sounds of Encouragement is a podcast production of Music Grow LLC, part of growing musicians and teachers everywhere. Sounds of Encouragement is hosted, produced, and edited by Melissa Slocum. To get in touch, contact soundofencouragement at gmail.com. You can also find Sounds of Encouragement on Clubhouse. Drop in weekly for a dose of personal encouragement. Theme music by Melissa Slocum and Steve Tressler. Music mixed and mastered by Steve Tressler. Thank you to Steve Tressler and Christina Lopriori who encouraged me to do this in the first place. And remember, I'm here for you, so you can be there for those who need you the most. <laughs>